Section 2 of The Sins of Hollywood by Ed Roberts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Duck Blinds. There are no houses of prostitution in Hollywood. No foot weary Magdalens patrol the night. Hollywood looks with contempt upon the hunger-driven sisterhood that haunts the streets and body houses here the merchandising of sex has been made a fine art its devotees are artists the unskilled worker is a pariah unwelcome the old barbary coast the old tenderloin Armor Avenue at their height are not Hollywood. There is no restricted district, no other side of the railroad track. There is nothing crude or tawdry about Hollywood. Hollywood loves refinement. Wherefore the joy parlors and the love nests of Hollywood are not all in Hollywood the artists pay a little more for what they get than anyone else go where they will and are welcomed foul fingers reach far out from the city into the green hills and valleys the reek of city vice mingles with the scented air of the open places hollywood overlooks no bets a thousand roads lead to canyon cabin, sequestered cottage, or mountain shack. There are easy routes to a score of hidden bays and inlets, where wait lavishly furnished yachts and houseboats. From San Diego to Del Monte, from the beach to the desert, Hollywood drips its ooze. The private dens, or retreats, is it, where the idols of our boys and girls disport and indulge their vices, span a hundred miles in any direction. It is in these snug bowers that the domesticity the fan magazine so lovingly and so lyingly prattle of is revealed in its true form. Here the veneer, assumed for box office purposes, vanishes. The language of the gutter resumes its place, as the mother tongue. A spade is a spade, or even a harder name. Passion is mad passion, and nothing less. No frowning madame calls a halt to maintain a show of order. Hollywood has eliminated the madame and the grafting policeman. They belong to the crude days. Hollywood knows no curb but satiation and exhaustion. Half a dozen miles north of the ridge route, on what is known as the Inland Highway, between Los Angeles and San Francisco, lies a small lake that nestles between the foothills and the highway. On its shores are scattered clumps of brush and a few blinds for duck hunters. In the stories we read of Sodom and Pompeii, there is nothing about duck blinds. Hollywood is creative requires no precedent hollywood has found a new use for duck blinds on the far side of the lake and about two hundred yards from the water's edge stands a frame house it is painted a dark shade of green the house and the acres that lie back of it are the property of two nationally famous film producers and a Los Angeles businessman who runs with the film crowd. Silence holds the greenhouse most of the time. 
the nearest neighbor is some distance away many shade trees hide his view of the greenhouse a few turkeys roam the hills to the passing motorist the greenhouse is but a speck on the landscape the general aspect is one of serenity and peace the scene is truly pastoral the spot exudes an air of rural innocence hollywood knows the value of atmosphere that is part of hollywood's business in studio parlance atmosphere and camouflage go hand in hand during the summer months the hills are hot and few visitors come to the greenhouse but as the days grow cooler and october draws near signs of life appear the duck season is approaching automobiles wind over the road back of the lake and unload their cargoes everything is made ready for hunter and huntress by the first of october all is in shape for the season sport the greenhouse duck hunter travels like the mexican army his women go with him the laws of california are the same for men or women who hunt ducks you must carry a hunting license the law says nothing about a marriage license so the little green house complies with the law also the law says nothing about chaperones for house parties of married people who do not happen to be married to each other again the greenhouse complies with the law more than one noted screen beauty has spent the weekend in the greenhouse more than one famed portrayer of screen innocence has hunted on these shores it is not every passing motorist that carries field glasses and the naked eye does not carry across the lake far enough to recognize faces from friday to saturday night through october november and december the greenhouse walks with kings and queens of shadowland it sees them at play in what the naturalist would call their native habitat untrammeled as it were by the artificial conventions of society or the demands of business it sees them shorn of their gloss and their glamour not long since a certain beauty who was once the wife of a widely advertised male vamp a hunting went on on the far shore of this lake this lady has achieved much fame she first won her way into the heart of a noted producer by hanging crepe on the lamp of a rival who was at that time basking in the sunshine of his favor and the public smile carmen stuff comes natural to her although she and the producer in question are not the pals they once were their names are more or less interwoven and they are still very good friends yes very dear friends he has a wife and family and must be more or less careful just as day was breaking the beauty was escorted to one of the blinds it was not quite light as yet and her escort a noted screen celebrity had to help her the blind is constructed in front of a rowboat moored to the shore 
it was cold. He had a bottle of which both partook freely. He emptied it and produced another. It was real cold. So they partook freely and cuddled close against the wind. There were few ducks that morning. In fact, the waters of the lake had been particularly low, and the birds hardly alighted before they flocked off again on their way southward. There were chances for, but few shots. It grew a bit lighter, but the cold wind grew colder. The spot began to lag. Pretty soon she dropped her gun and snuggled closer to him and took a few more drinks. He continued peering into the distance in search of passing birds. Up over the edge of a hill, some distance back from the house, a man with field glasses gazed intently. As the woman cuddled closer, he fixed his gaze more intently. For weeks he had been watching the place, unknown to its owners. Of course he had no idea of the prominence of those he spied upon, or he might have hesitated. There is not much spice in the life of ranch hands. When tales of strange carryings on come floating over the hills early in the season, the man with the field glasses bethought himself of a good use for them. More than once his vigil had been rewarded. But this time he was puzzled. He could not tell what was coming. He did not know a new thrill when he saw one. He was not an artist. His eyes remained riveted on the scene before him. Soon the woman's male companion dropped his gun, rested his arm on the side of the boat, slid down into the bottom, with his legs sprawled over one of the seats, and appeared to have fallen asleep. The beauty yawned, took another drink, and sat down on the same seat. For a long time, the watcher on the hill could detect no sign of life. Clouds came up and hid the sun. There was no stir in the green house. The other occupants, if there were any, were evidently fast asleep. A flock of birds made a sweep over the edge of the lake and settled. Another bunch came and joined the first. Sun and sky remained obscured. The pair in the boat were still inert. The watcher on the hill grew more puzzled than ever. What had happened? He stepped down and started to circle to the lower reaches of the ridge, over toward a pass in a canyon that led in the house. Cautiously he drew nearer, until he was on the rim of a high bluff, directly overlooking the blind. On this bluff a hole had been dug into the ground, and crawling toward it, he slid out of sight until he was entirely covered. From this vantage point he could, with the aid of the glasses, see all that transpired. More ducks came. No shots were fired. The mystery deepened. A slight ripple danced away from the side of the boat as it slowly rocked. The ripples grew larger and came more often. The boat rocked more violently. The watcher lifted his glasses and gazed again. This time he did not remove them from his eyes. The glasses remained fixed, or rather transfixed. The watcher was oblivious to all else but what was going on in the rowboat on the water's edge. Suddenly the boat rocked more violently than ever. It seemed to be having a spasm. 
The watcher jumped to the edge of the hole. He could stand it no longer. He waved his hands aloft. Oh, the dirty dogs, he cried out aloud as he walked into the open. There was a flurry of wings as the startled ducks took to the air. The boat gave a final lurch, like a ship in a gale. The watcher on the hill had recognized the beauty. He knew the face, had seen her in pictures a thousand times. But he had never read of Sodom or Pompeii. End of section two.